April the 25th, 1915, men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps landed at Gallipoli. It was on that day the traditions of our fighting forces were born. These stories of their sons and daughters at war we proudly dedicate to the memory of Anzac. The ships and the men of the Royal Australian Navy, and in particular of the part they played in the vital task of protecting convoys in all the oceans of the world. The 8-inch gun cruiser HMAS Australia was the most powerful unit of the RAN when war broke out. One of her early missions, in May 1940, was to escort Australian and New Zealand troops en route to Britain. The Australians were the 18th Infantry Brigade of the 6th Division with attached troops. The Atlantic speed record holder, Queen Mary, the world's second largest ship, sailed from New York to Sydney to embark them. Eight thousand Australian troops boarded Queen Mary, Mauritania and Empress of Canada. A contingent of the Royal Australian Air Force travelled with them. Once the troops were aboard, they were the responsibility of the Navy. It was the Navy's job to escort them on their perilous voyage halfway across the world to reinforce embattled Britain. It was upon the Navy that they relied for protection against the submarines lying in wait along the sea lanes against fast German pocket battleships and other surface raiders, and against air attack. Even entering the friendly waters of South Africa, Vigilance could not be relaxed. Cape Town was the convoy's first port of call since leaving Fremantle. It had been reached without incident or loss. HMAS Australia handed over her escort duties to British warships, which took the convoy on to its final anchorage in the Clyde. Australian men of war, Sydney, Canberra and Perth, in company with New Zealand, British and French warships, escorted convoys from Australia and New Zealand to the Middle East. These Anzac convoys, carrying thousands of men and great quantities of supplies, relied for their safety on the vigilance of the Navy. In the never-ending battle of the Atlantic, the great movement of ships loaded with troops, munitions, petrol and food from Canada and the United States to Britain. Australian ships like the cruisers Australia and Perth played their part. They helped to escort vital convoys of merchantmen across the Atlantic, where Germany had mustered the bulk of her submarine navy to cut Britain's lifeline, and where every convoy involved a bitter and costly battle. Nature was often hostile too. Merchant men and naval escorts had to face the fury of Atlantic gales. But the most dangerous enemies were the German submarines, organized in boot packs and lying in wait across the convoy's tracks. The lucky ones had time to abandon ship. Others weren't so fortunate. 
German aircraft joined the U-boats in attacks on the convoys as they approached their journey's end. The hard-pressed warships of the escort had to face and fight off this new danger. safety of the convoy depended entirely on the skill and accuracy of the Navy's gunners. The freighters and the tankers and their long enduring crews just had to keep course and take it. was the price in lives and in ships which had to be paid to supply and sustain Britain, the last bastion of freedom in Europe. In the narrow waters of the Mediterranean, just as in the broad wastes of the Atlantic and the Pacific, there were convoys to be run. Here too, Australian warships were in the forefront of the action. Sydney and destroyers of the scrap iron flotilla, the sloops Parramatta and Yarra, and later the crews of Perth and the new destroyers Nizam, Napier and Nestor. There was never any lack of action for the ships of the Mediterranean fleet. Getting supplies into Malta was a hazardous and costly business in the face of enemy submarines and air power, and with a powerful but timorous Italian fleet waiting its chance of a sneak attack. Danger was ever present from the sea and from the sky. For the naval escort, and particularly the destroyers, it meant never-ending vigilance and never-ending tension. The convoys upon which the island depended for its very existence had to be got through, whatever the cost. The preservation of Malta was vital to Allied strategy in the Mediterranean. Malta not only had deep and protected harbours which made it a natural naval base, but more importantly now, it had airfields from which the enemy could be harassed. Usually nightfall brought respite from the attack, but sometimes the enemy used the darkness as a cover. Dawn brought more aircraft to attack out of the rising sea. some flown by Australians of the RAAF, gave welcome protection as the survivors of the convoy approached the bomb-battered island and moved to their berths in Valletta. Somehow, they had got their precious supplies through. <laughs> 
In the Atlantic, the vast and powerful German pocket battleship, Admiral Scher, was a different and equally deadly threat to Allied convoys, and Australian warships took part in the hunt for her. Admiral Scher's orders were to avoid action with Allied warships and to disrupt merchant shipping. When her commander thought he had a chance of getting captured ships home to Germany, he did not sink them, but put prize crews aboard. But when convoys were sighted, the Scher's job was to sink as many ships as she could. This convoy's only escort was the armed merchant cruiser Jarvis Bay, whose captain, Fogarty Fagan, was a former commander at the Royal Australian Naval College. Though hopelessly outclassed, Jarvis Bay fought to the last. Admiral Scher succeeded in sinking only five ships out of 37. Jarvis Bay's sacrifice enabled 32 ships of the convoy to escape. There were a few survivors, but the gallant Fogarty Fagan was not amongst them. Mortally wounded, he fought his ship to the end and went down with her. He was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. in the Middle East had to be recalled to Australia to meet the new Japanese enemy, it was again the ships of the RAN which convoyed them safely home. Now the 9th Division, the last of the three, was homeward bound. Brigadier Whitehead and his 26th Brigade in the new Amsterdam hold boat drill. <music> Lieutenant John Gregory, the only platoon commander of the 2nd 48th Battalion to come through Alamein unwounded is one who, thanks to the Navy, enjoys a safe voyage. The great movements of ships and troops involved in the return of the AIF threw a heavy strain on the resources of the Royal Australian Navy, and it was a triumph of naval organisation that the AIF convoys returned as they had sailed in 1940 without the loss of a single ship. Veterans of the Desert War landed for brief leave before facing the new Japanese threat in the north. Now, with Japan in the war, Japanese bombers struck victoriously southwards. The burdens of the RAN became heavier and heavier. The Japanese had early established air superiority over their outnumbered opponents. Suicide tactics of the Mikaze pilots, who spared neither themselves nor their planes, became an ever-increasing threat to the ships of the Royal Australian Navy and its allies. Land-based aircraft formed an integral part of Japan's naval establishment and cooperated closely with carrier aircraft. The Japanese fleet was the most formidable opponent the RAN had ever faced. It comprised 11 battleships, 40 cruisers, 10 aircraft carriers, 100 destroyers and 63 submarines. 
Now the overworked ships of the RAN were called on to protect Australia's 12,000 mile coastline. Waters which had long been considered safe became the hunting ground of Japanese submarines. Australian merchant ships and Australian merchant seamen were now in the front line and had to bear the brunt of Japan's savage undersea attacks. Despite all the efforts of the Navy, losses in ships and men were severe. Australian warships fought in desperate sea battles from Singapore to the Solomons as the Allies strove to hold Japan's southward thrust. HMAS Australia took part in the great Coral Sea victory where the American aircraft carrier Yorktown was mortally hit. Japanese suicide pilots press home their attacks, regardless of death. Despite their sacrifice, Japan suffered a major defeat in the Coral Sea. Threat of Japanese submarines, the convoy system had to be adopted for Australian coastal shipping. The RAAF cooperated with the Navy. The Air Force carried out its own anti-submarine patrols and also worked closely with the RAN in the direct protection of the coastwise convoys. From the port of Newcastle, ships move out to join a convoy as it steams along the coast. Out to sea, a grim hunter waits for its prey. The RAAF Hudson forms part of the convoy's escort. Frigates of the RAN, newly built in Australian dockyards, shepherd the convoy. More than 60 corvettes were built in Australia for this purpose and were largely manned by reserves. Overhead, the crew of the Hudson keep watch. The workaday courage of the men of the merchant service manned ships like these earned the Navy's respect. They never knew when hidden death would strike from the sea, but keen eyes are alert for their protection. The Hudson spots the submarine, reports its position to the naval escort and puts down a marker flare. Escort prepares to attack. Depth charges are made ready. As the tide of war turned against him, there were convoys of a very different kind for the Royal Australian Navy. 
When the Allied forces went over to the offensive, ships of the RAN convoyed the assault troops to the attack. The pattern was heated as the Allied offensive gained momentum. The RAN escorted American and Australian troops. In every island attack that the men of the AIF made, there were Australian warships guarding them as they moved towards their objectives. The RAN had protected the AIF as it sailed off to war in 1940. Now in the last great Australian assault by the 7th Division on Barikopan, the RAN was there to see its army comrades safe ashore. September the 2nd, 1945, VJ Day. On the American battleship Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Bay, General Blamey and other Allied leaders wait while the Japanese delegation prepares for the surrender ceremony. General Douglas MacArthur makes a brief address. Air Vice Marshal Jones, watched by Commodore Collins, RAN, signs the surrender document, and then the representatives of the Japanese government and armed forces come forward to sign. For Commodore Collins, General Blamey, and Air Vice Marshal Jones, RAAF, this was the day of all days they would remember. But for the RAN, the surrender in Tokyo Bay was not the last word. The Australian frigate HMAS Diamantina, for instance, had her own surrender ceremonies at Nauru and Ocean Islands. With the war over, the ships of the RAN had the final task of bringing the fighting men home. The armed merchant cruiser Westphalia carried troops back from New Guinea. For all, the first sight of Australian soil was a moving moment. Hard to believe that the long years of war and danger and hardship and separation from loved ones are over at last. Hard to believe that one can sail the seas without the constant threat of attack. Never the approach to Sydney so welcoming. Never has the Harbour Bridge seemed more like a symbol of home. For the Royal Australian Navy, the safe return of the Australian Army marked especially the end of a chapter. From 1940 to 1945, Australian troops had moved across the seas under the Navy's protection. the Navy's last duty to the Army had been performed. The tradition, symbolised by Britain's flagship victory, had been linked in the Australian Navy with Australia's own tradition of Anzac.